You ready? Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, that's my job. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a Hollywood production here. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Barbara Matas, and I'm representing MAWPAC. But this evening has been put on um, in conjunction with uh, Democratic, uh, Democrats for America, represented by Carol Mills. Carol? Oh, Democracy for America. <laughs> oh, sorry. Democracy, excuse me. Sometimes they are Democrats. Sometimes they're Greens. All right, but they're for democracy. Uh, let's see, uh, Progressive Democrats of America, represented by Dan Monte, and then the 10th AD Democratic Club, represented by Evelyn Wu, and uh, I guess Ed Forrest, too. So um, it's our privilege to have Ellen Brown here tonight, uh, and I think all of our groups have uh, wanted to have her uh, come and speak to us, so it's great that we can all get together. Uh, before we start, I just want to give a plug for all the work that MAWPAC is going to be doing over the next few weeks. Uh, we have a luncheon next Friday at um, Smith Ranch, uh, well, it's McGin the club at uh, McGinnis. Uh, Fiona Ma will be our speaker, at, along with Katie Rice. Uh, so I hope all of you will come. It's a great event. It's uh, only $40 for lunch and, and a fun time, so I hope you can come. Uh, on April 2nd, we are having a workshop for candidates. That is uh, another bargain because we have some really great speakers who are going to be talking about networking, using the media. So it's set up for candidates, but also if you have issues and you want to learn how to get your issues out there to as many people as possible, this is a good workshop for you. That will be April 2nd, again at McGinnis, and uh, dinner and workshop is $30. So. Another great deal. Uh, April 9th and April 23rd, uh, MAWPAC will have endorsements here in uh, this uh, room. Uh, April 9th, we're going to be doing our endorsement for the congressional seat. And April 23rd, our endorsement for all the local uh, elections. Uh, and uh, on April 9th, we're going to have a reception at um, Hannah's uh, prior to the endorsement night. and. Uh, Everyone's invited. It's a great opportunity to actually meet the candidates and have a conversation with them. So um, hopefully we, we invite everyone. Um, tonight, I think we can all think back about uh, four years ago to 2008 when uh, between the greed of Wall Street and an administration that was beholden to the free market uh, the economy of the United States and Europe uh, was nearly um, decimated. Uh, today, we're still experiencing the effects of this uh, um, greed and uh, philosophy uh, in the form of decreased services and layoff of municipal workers. Uh, one state, North Dakota, seems to have been able to evade this um, this experience, and our speaker tonight, Ellen Brown, is going to tell us how that happened. Thank you. Um, I don't, don't have a clicker, so I have to say next, next, next. <laughs> uh, so I'm president of the Public Banking Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit grassroots. Uh, volunteer organization, but what we do is to promote the idea that the way state and local governments could solve their budget crisis or go a long ways towards solving it is to own their own banks. Next. Oh, we'll try. Okay. Um, so California, since 2009, has faced budget deficits of a hundred billion dollars. Huge. Um, so we were one time the sixth largest economy, now we're, now we're broke. Next. And, and even with radical cuts, um, we still are facing in 2013 uh, a budget deficit of five to eight billion or more 
even they've slashed the really important social services, education, Medicaid, um, the homeless are being cut back. I mean, we have tent cities around which are, are like Hoovervilles from the 30s. Next. Um, it's, it's not just, California is the worst, but um, all, virtually all states are in that position, nearly all. Next. All except one, North Dakota. <laughs> um, North Dakota completely escaped the budget crisis. They, not, they have no debt at all. In fact, they have a, a sizable budget surplus and have every year since 2008. Um, they have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest foreclosure rate, and the lowest uh, default rate on loans. Next. Uh, they are also the only state to own their own bank. Uh, by law, they put all the revenues in the Bank of North Dakota. And so they are return they're returning the money to the state using those resources, creating credit from their own revenues rather than giving this credit power away to Wall Street. Next. Uh, some people say, well, North Dakota has oil and that's the reason they're doing so well. But in fact, there are other states that have oil that are not doing so well. Texas and Alaska, for two, have more oil than North Dakota. Um, and if you look globally, 40% um, of banks globally are publicly owned. We don't hear about it, but they are. And these are largely in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which um, contain 40% of the population globally. And these are the countries that escaped the credit crisis. They have done remarkably well in the last decade, growing by 92.3%, I think, uh, versus 15% for Western countries. So they're obviously due to pass this up, and a good part of it is because of their banking system, where they, they return the proceeds from um, um, financial products, as you see, you know, for financial services back to the, the community rather than siphoning them out as the private banking system does. Next. So what could you do if you owned your own bank? For one thing, instead of borrowing at, say, 5%, as state and local governments have to do, and being vulnerable to um, uh, the rating agencies and interest rate variations and uh, uh, short sellers, uh, you can borrow at the Fed funds rate, 0.25%. Banks have an instant credit line with other banks for almost nothing. They're getting money almost for nothing. So that's uh, 20, 1 20th of what a state or local government would be paying at 5%. Um, you can partner with local banks. This is what North Dakota does, Bank of North Dakota. They partner with the local banks and so that local banks can make more loans, loans that they wouldn't have been able to make otherwise. Uh, this supports local business, local homeowners, allows the businesses to pay more taxes. So, it, it, so not only does the bank itself generate profits for the state, but it stimulates the whole economy, which then, which then generates profits for the state. Uh, you can have instant credit lines for state and local governments. So instead of these huge rainy day funds that all governments now have to keep because they don't have credit lines, because they, if they go over budget, they have to go to the voters or they have to borrow very expensively short term. So it's very cumbersome and it's actually happened where cities have just come to a standstill because they miscalculated their budget and they had to go back to the voters before they could get more money. Well, if you own your own bank, you just tap up a credit line with your bank. And so that's what happens in North Dakota. The government, uh, the state government, a few years ago did go over budget and said no problem, they just took out a loan with the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, there was a flood recently, or well, I think it was five years ago, but it, it was on, Minnesota was on one side, North Dakota was on the other side of the river. And on the North Dakota side, they didn't have to wait for FEMA. They just hit up the Bank of North Dakota with a very cheap credit line, restored the city, and now today you wouldn't know that anything had happened. They've totally rebuilt the city. On the Minnesota side, it's still devastated. I mean, it's like a ghost town. They haven't rebuilt it yet because they don't have that 
that cr credit facility to to do what they need to do. Um, you can keep the benefits of federal lending programs in the state. Um, there are VA loans, FHA loans, student loans that that all have guarantee. They're guaranteed by the government, and these are these are big operations that normally a community bank can't handle. So they go to the Wall Street banks. So the Wall Street banks get this free money basically because they're federally guaranteed. So say it's three percent loan. That's 3% guaranteed money because the Fed will pick up the, will make sure that you get paid. Well, the Bank of North Dakota takes those loans because they're big enough to do it. And so they have a pot of money that are their own profits. Of course, they've been in business for 93 years as well. So they've got their own profits from their own loans over 93 years, plus this money that they get from the, from the federal government to cover their guaranteed loans. So they have a nice pool of money that's guaranteed. They're not spending the government's money at all. When they do something that might entail a little more risk, some sort of loan that's a bit risky, they're using their own funds that they've built up from this quite safe pool of money. Um, and you keep your state revenues in the state, so instead of sending, putting your money in Wall Street banks, which pay you a very, very small uh, interest these days on your savings account um, and then lend it back to you at 5% and then send their advisors in to tell you how to invest it. And for example, in California, we lost 25% and 30% CalPERS did in the two years following 2008 after paying a lot of money for bad investment by advice from Wall Street advisors. So in North Dakota, they keep all that in-state invest it in their own state, leverage their own money instead of giving it away to Wall Street to use to bet against them. Next. Um, so to understand why this works, the first thing you have to understand is the secret of banking, which is that banks don't just lend their depositors money or their own money. They create money. Every time they make a loan, they create money. I, there, I know one treasurer of a state objected that we couldn't set up a state bank because we need our revenues. We can't, you know, we, we need them for our daily, daily needs. We can't be lending out these revenues. But that's not how banking works. You put that money in the bank and you lend out the very same money that's still there in the bank. You've got it on deposit and you're lending out at the same time. So there are many, I could sort, cite many sources, but um, this chart, I think, proves the case. It goes up to 2006, which is when the Fed quit reporting M3, which is the largest measure of the money supply. Um, the blue line is M1. That's what we normally think of as money, coins, checkbook money, and uh, dollar bills. So coins and dollar bills go about halfway up the blue line. So even assuming you count dollar bills as government-issued money, which can be challenged because they're Federal Reserve notes, which are actually issued by the 12 Federal Reserve branches, all of which are 100% owned by the private banks in their district. But even if you accept that Federal Reserve notes are government-issued money, you can see it only government-issued money only goes halfway up the blue line, and all of the rest comes from somewhere else, and that's the money created by banks when they make loans. Next. Um, th this is the textbook model of how it how it's done. It's not, it just, we know now that they don't bother to wait till they've got the deposits before they make the loans. But it's, it's more or less like this. This is how, this is how it's supposed to work. You, you take a $100 deposit, you put it in the bank, you're supposed to hold back 10%, assuming a 10% reserve requirement. So you can then make a $90 loan, which goes into the borrower's account. The borrower writes a check on it. It goes into another bank. So that bank says, oh good, we have on a $90 deposit. We can now make an $8,100 loan. So they've got $90 in their bank and they lend out $8,100. Er, $81. And then the next bank will lend 90% of that and so on until $100 has become $1,000. Um, and none of those deposits, those de the deposits are all still there in the bank. Next. So this, this makes that even more clear. It's a chart from uh, the Chicago Federal Reserve uh, Modern Money Mechanics. This is, 
at the very bottom, that, that row at the bottom is uh, the deposit. So you have an initial deposit of $10,000. Um, you put it in the bank. The bank can then lend $9,000, which is the first black a rectangle. Uh, and then that 9000 goes into the bank number two, which can then lend $8,100. And then that goes into bank number three, which can lend 90% of that, and so on. So $10,000 becomes $100,000. But you can see that, that that gray bar at the bo bottom, that $10,000 never left the first bank. And the $9,000 never left the second bank. And the $8,100 never left the third bank. Those deposits are still there. So that's the secret. You, We've got, well, I'll get to this, but... The um, treasurer has a lot of money stashed away. That money could be sitting in a bank, and it could be you could double your money basically because you can lend it out at the same time. It's sitting there, available for your use when you need it. Uh, this is a these. The chart on the right is the money supply. The chart on the left is a federal debt. So you can see they're basically the same thing, and they're both growing exponentially, and that. We need the federal debt, actually. If we had no federal debt, we would have no money supply. Uh, the problem with this way of making money is that banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest when they make a loan. And if you have, a, say, a 20 or 30 year loan, it's, um, you pay as much back in interest or more as, as the principal. So basically, the bank lends 100000 takes back 200000 Lends two hundred thousand, takes back four hundred thousand. Lends four hundred, takes back eight hundred. So it's a it's a unsustainable pyramid scheme. Next, so that explains why debt grows exponentially because of this interest. It also explains the widening gap in economic indicators. This chart is from Margaret Kennedy, who is a German researcher who's. Uh, done a lot of research on hidden interest, the hidden interest charges that we pay. The red is um, financial assets. The, the, um, the blue or purple is a gross national product and the green is wages and salaries. So you can see going all the way back to 1950 that wages and salaries are not enough to buy our, the goods and services that the laborers actually create. Um, but you can see the disparity gets worse and worse, and the disparity with the financial industry gets way worse. So, so when we're down here at 1995, and, and it's, it's off the charts, of course, today, but she only went up to 1995 there, um, <coughs> labor can't come near to buying the goods and services they made, that big purple bar. So what they do is they borrow. They borrow to buy the goods and services, but that means they owe it back with interest. So, so the red bar continually gets larger and larger relative to the others. So the 90, the one percent gets bigger, gets more, and the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, and there, there is this myth that it's okay that this whole debt system is okay because we're all borrowers and we're all lenders in some sense. Like you put your money in the bank and you get some, some. Um, interest back and then you borrow at interest, but that's not actually true. She has shown that 90% um, of people are net borrowers and only 10% are net creditors or net lenders. And so again, you can see over time the disparity has gotten greater and greater. Next. So, this, so it's basically a pyramid scheme and it's unsustainable. It would be sustainable if the interest were fed back into the economy and back to the people, which is what a public banking system does. But as long as you're siphoning, siphoning the interest out and putting it back in the form of loans or investments where you expect to take back more than you put out there, it's an unsustainable pyramid scheme. Um, this, this chart was put out by a group that arguing that we have to get rid of entitlements, that it's the entitlements that are killing us. But you can see that the entitlements, or the debt itself, is, is actually pretty manageable. It doesn't grow that much. Where's going up. Well, it's, um, Medicare is the, the light blue, Medicaid is the purple, Social Security is the green. 
um, than other non-interest defense and receipts. Um, but you can see that it's not the entitlements that are the problem, it's the interest. It's the interest that's killing us. And had we borrowed all along from our own central bank, I mean, once you realize that banks themselves create all our money, it might as well have been our own central bank, giving, which would give us the interest back, which they do now. The Federal Reserve rebates the interest to the government. Or the state might as well be borrowing from its own state bank, and then it would get the interest back. You can see that the debt itself is not a big problem. It's the interest that makes it unsustainable. Next. Now this chart shows that, too, that without interest, we might not even have a debt. Um, that on the left is a $15 trillion debt that we have today. The Federal Reserve has a chart that sh goes back 24 years, showing what we paid in principal and interest each year. So I added it up, and it came to $8.2 trillion in interest. We paid $8.2 trillion in interest on a $15 trillion debt just in 24 years. And the debt has not been paid off since 1835. So arguably, if you went all the way back, you wouldn't have a debt at all. And that, that would be true in France for sure. The French, um, the second set of blocks, their data goes back to 1973. The interest they have paid since 1973 equals their existing debt. So if they had not had to pay that interest, they would have no debt today. And the Canadians have actually paid twice as much in interest since 1961 as their current debt is. So it's obviously the debt that's killing them. Next. And that's also true of California's debt. This is the California General Obligation and Revenue Bonds going to 158 billion, um, 70 billion of that is interest. So if we had had a Bank of California going back to 1919, like uh, North Dakota has, and had been borrowing from our own bank all along, we would at least be 70 billion dollars richer, probably more than that. So we wouldn't have the budget problem we have today at all. Next. So how do you get rid of interest to own the bank? And then you get the interest back, or you don't even have to charge yourself interest. Now, arguably, the rating agencies are going to complain if you start lending to yourself, you know, interest-free, if the state starts. But you can get around that by buying municipal bonds, for example, that would have the same interest rate that you are paying on your debt, and then you just collect that interest and pay off your, your debt. Next. Um, Margaret Kennedy showed that uh, across all all types of products, including hidden interest costs, these are the costs of manufacturing all the way up the line, 40% uh, of everything we buy is interest. And that is also true of public projects. Some of them are more, ex more expensive than others, interest-wise. Um, for example, housing, actually 77% of housing goes to interest. But across the full spectrum, 40% of public projects goes to interest. So if you funded those projects with your own bank, as has been done in different places historically, like Australia did it brilliantly well, New Zealand did it, uh, the BNDES in Brazil is doing it now, funding, funding all sorts of development. So what, basically what you're doing is just creating the credit, putting the credit out there, and then the credit itself, the loan itself pays for itself with the proceeds of the thing you built. If you eliminate interest, things that look unsustainable suddenly became, become sustainable, in fact, become profitable. Next. Um, so if you, so cutting out interest would cut the cost of public projects by 40%. Next. Um, this is just an example I saw on the internet. It was just an article on the internet that said um, it was a project in Rhode Island for uh, wind power that if you finance this wind power plant with a private developer, the interest rate is 9.5% and that it was a 12-year project. So at that rate, the cost of wind power was 5 cents per kilowatt hour. Next. But um, the 9.5% actually triples the cost over the, that period of 12 years. This is called the rule of 114. Next. So, so that means if you hadn't, didn't have to pay interest, if you funded it through your own bank, um, the cost of wind power would actually be cheaper than any form of electricity we have right now. Next. 
Uh, this is a comparison of the North Dakota population to deposits in the Bank of North Dakota and what California could have on the same model. Uh, North Dakota, of course, they've had this bank since 1919, but they have managed, and all their state revenues go, go into this bank by law. So they've, they've managed to accumulate $4,000 per capita in deposits, and they have loans of nearly that amount uh, against these deposits. So California has a population of 37 million. If you multiplied that by 4,000, we could have a deposit, or could have had, had we been doing this all along, have a deposit base of 148 billion and potential loans of 142 billion. We could be quite well off. Next. Uh, but you say California doesn't have 148 billion in posit deposits. That's true. But what it does have is, um, this is just what's obvious, the investment pool. There's all sorts of other money tucked around in all sorts of funds that could go into this bank. But just consider the investment pool, uh, the treasurer's investment pool. The treasurer says on his website that he keeps two, two billion, uh, roughly, in demand deposits, and that's enough to cover the budgetary needs of, you know, the day-to-day -day budgetary needs. And all the rest goes into the treasurer's investment pool. It now has 67 billion in it, and it's it just it sort of it gradually goes up. It drops like it drops a little sometimes, so they must have spent a little of it here and there. But generally, most of that money stays in this pool, and it just kind of creeps up. And it, right now, it is drawing 0.49 percent interest. So that's almost nothing. 67 billion dollars sitting there doing nothing except drawing a very little interest. And this money can't be used for the budget because it's there are all these regulations that say, you know, this agency's money goes for this and like the highway money fund goes for the highways, etc. And so the governor can't tap, tap that money up. But it can be invested and it can be shifted from one investment to another. Right now it's in a number of banks it could be shifted into the Bank of California. The Bank of California could spend, could pay 0.49% on their savings accounts, just like, so and all those, mostly this is the state itself, but some of them are state agencies that have chosen to use the investment pool. They would all be getting the same 0.49% that they're getting now. But on top of that, the state could then be leveraging that 67 billion some of that they could use for capital. You need 8% capital. So let's say on 67 billion, you, you're going to need 6 billion, let's say. So, so if you pull out 6 billion and call that capital, all the rest you call that deposits, you can be making a good 60 billion in, in loans on just on that investment pool, drawing, say, 5% interest. So you're making much more than the 0.49%, you're making 5%. And of that money, $35 billion is in something called a surplus money investment fund. I mean, it has no name other than this is extra money. And if you, just, if you look at it over the last decade, it hasn't done anything it, except it kind of creeps up. Sometimes they spend a little bit of it, but not very much. So that money, certainly some of that could be pulled out and used for your capital base. You're not spending it. You're just moving it over from bank A to bank B and calling it capital. And so then you, even if 67 isn't 142 billion or 148 billion, in Wall Street banks borrow at least half of their deposits. Some Wall Street banks borrow more than that. So you could borrow the rest. Argue, I mean, I, I don't think it's a good plan, but it's, it's conceivable. You could do that and get up to 148 billion right now or close to it. Another way, though, to double your deposits is to do what the Bank of North Dakota does, which is they partner with the local banks. So they put up a certain portion of the capital and they, they provide the liquidity. And then the local bank, the local bank does what it can. And then the Bank of North Dakota adds to it to allow it to take on projects that the local bank couldn't otherwise afford or wouldn't have the, the Bank of North Dakota will guarantee the loan so they don't have to worry about the capital requirements. So in that way, you double your money again because you're sharing with the deposit base that the local banks already have. And so it's just a big partnership where you're all sharing your money, pooling it, using that credit to, to fund the local economy instead of funding Wall Street. Next. 
So if we had 142 billion, what we could do, arguably, this, this is a totally safe, conservative thing you could do that um, is buy municipal bonds at 5% would generate 7.1 billion. So that's actually enough to pay that deficit that we don't know how to pay even after all these radical slash, uh, slashes to the budget. So you could eliminate, so that's 7 billion that we're just giving away to Wall Street every year that we, we could be using ourselves. But again, you could get, you could do, come to the same results. You, you could generate that much money or more by partnering with the local banks and stimulating the whole economy, that your businesses will pay more taxes, that you'll put people to work and they'll pay more taxes, plus you're getting a nice, whatever, 5% return on your invest, on the, on the, this credit that you've leveraged into, or this uh, credit that you've created out of your deposit and capital base. Next. So, so that's the, the secret of public banking, or the why public banking works, is that the, the profits are returned to the center. So, so it's sustainable. You return the profits, you generate more credit from that, which generates more business, more jobs, and it, it all feeds on itself. Rather than having your banking system feed on the economy, it feeds the economy. Next. So, so that's if you ha that's my <laughs> talk. So, if you have any questions or you want more information, we have a website, publicbankinginstitute.org, and it has all kinds of data and charts. And we have a conference coming up April twenty seventh and eighth in Philadelphia, which is where the Quakers founded the first ever public bank, uh, you know, among the colonies. Um, and and then my website is webofdebt.com. And I have like over 100 articles on there on, on this subject.